All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the man, Daddy D. All right. Good morning, guys. Well, we're in Philippians, and, um, you know, the Holy Spirit came to Paul in a dream and said, you know, I, I don't, you're not going to North Asia. I want you to go to Greece, to Macedonia, to Philippi, because there's some people there who need to hear about Jesus Christ. And you know he did that for you in your life, right? I mean, you would not know him unless he drew you to himself, unless, some, unless he put together some way, somehow, that you got to hear and understand who he is and what the good news is and what Jesus did for us. And isn't that incredible that we serve a God like that? Do you know there's no other religion that, that even teaches that? That what they teach is that we have to work our way to God, not that God wants to have a relationship and works his way to us. So Paul, Paul, um, these people in Philippi had quite a relationship with Paul. They were probably the most persecuted church. Uh, Philippi was occupied by Roman soldiers. That was a retirement community. And if you became a Christian in Philippi, you were canceled. Um, you know, I saw a, a news clip this week, a student at my home state in Wisconsin. He was reading scripture into today's environment. This is what God has to say about, about what's going on. And people came pounding a drum next to him, uh, just had a siren blowing, took God's word, took the scripture, ripped it up, and one kid started eating it. Wow. <laughs> that's what's going on on our campuses, right? Well, that's what's going on throughout Philippi. So when Paul writes them, first he, first he says, you know, I know you're concerned about me. So he answers about his imprisonment. And one of the things he said was, understand this, everything that happened has been good because the palace guards, I mean, you could not even get close to these guys. They've all come to know Jesus because they're chained to me. There's six, they have to get, every six hours, a new guy gets chained to me. And they've all come to know who, who Christ is. And then the Christians on the street are hearing that I'm sharing that. So they're now bold and they're sharing their faith. And so... He, now, Paul, what Paul's doing as we come to chapter two is he's transitioning from telling them about his imprisonment. And he's going to talk to them about their predicament. So go ahead and take your table card or open up the Philippians chapter two. And he starts out the chapter by saying, therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and purpose. So what is he saying? How many Georgia fans do we have in the room today? So you got a big game this weekend, right? <laughs> so if, if Paul, to, to kind of do a parallel, Paul was saying, hey, if, if, you're, if you're a Georgia fan, Make my joy complete by having the same mind, having the same unit, having the same spirit about you <laughs> that no matter what's going to happen tomorrow, you're going to be cheering on the team, right? And so that's what he's saying here. But he starts out with a word, therefore. And so if I said to you, therefore, Manny, I think, why don't we go ahead and let's, let's go do this, right? What would you say? What are you referencing? Like, <laughs> You're saying, therefore, do that. What, what's the therefore? So every time in the Bible, you've probably heard this, when you see a therefore, you stop and say, what is that therefore? So when Paul's saying, therefore, if you have any encouragement, what, what's he referencing back to? So we have to go back a few verses into chapter 1, starting at verse 27, which is actually where we left off, okay? So let's read that. It's, it's Philippians 1, verse 27, and then through 30. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Not easy to do, right? Live as, it's, but it's logical. Um, I brought back the rope. Um, it's probably half the people in the room know what this rope is, right? It's, it's a timeline rope, it's eternity rope. What this rope represents is if you can picture this rope as being a timeline, okay? So this rope right now is in my hand. It goes out to the right. It's actually going outside that door. If you picture that rope then going not only out the door, but down 400, all the way down through Florida, continue on, just wrap itself around the planet a couple times, and then go off into space, that's our life. It doesn't end. 
our life, our existence, we're, we're eternal beings. We go on through all eternity. This red on the end, on the front of it here is our time on earth and all that, right? It's, we're only here for a very short period of time. So Paul's reminding us our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is not here. Um, <clears throat> Gail, when he started mentoring me, three things right on the front end. One, let's talk about Solomon. If the wisest man in the world didn't finish well, what makes you think you will? So let's, let's, let's look at that, Ron. Okay, the second thing that he said was, hey, understand the history of our conflict. Understand what happened, what we're told, when Satan fell, why did he fall? And what does that now mean to us today? And then the third thing was, understand this. <clears throat> when he started mentoring me, he was my age. Okay, I was a little bit older than Ryan. So he said, look, <clears throat> you got a new business. As your business grows, this is true about all of us, as our life goes on, as we gain more things, as we have more success, our attention here becomes greater. Our love for here becomes greater. Where it should be the opposite. The more mature we get, the more we go on, we should be looking even that much forward to where our citizenship really is because there's only this much of it that's here. So while we're here, what does he want us to do? Well, this is what he's going to, this is what he's talking to the Philippians about. Your citizenship is in heaven. It's only this much. Your citizenship is, your citizenship is all the white. It goes on forever. You're here for a short period of time. Hutch hit on it last while here. Don't take God's name in vain. Know his names, know who he is. Know that he can do, he is Elohim. Nothing's impossible for him. He can do everything. He's Jehovah Jireh, he provides. He's Jehovah Nisi, you're going through something, he's your banner of protection. Don't diminish that, people are looking at you. Be the light for him during this little bit of time right here. That's where he's, that's where he's heading. So he says, all you must live as citizens of heaven, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news. You know the good news. You know your citizenship is there. You know, you know that you are saved. You know that God did that for you. So live your life in a way that reflects that. Then whether I come see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for faith, which is the good news. <clears throat> We're outnumbered. On this planet in the red, we're outnumbered. Most of the people on this planet don't follow Christ. Most don't worship the Heavenly Father, right? So we're in a minority. But what he's telling us is, while the world wants you to fall, God wants you to stand. Don't be intimidated by them. It's only for this long. Don't be intimidated by a world that wants you to act or wants you to be silent or doesn't want you to reflect what you know. Don't be intimidated by that. When you're not intimidated, it'll be a sign to them that they're gonna be destroyed, but that you're going to be saved, even by God himself. We know this, if you're in competition, you know this, right? If you show confidence, the competition starts looking at you instead of, you know, if you're in a golf tournament, right? You're concentrating on the flag and you're feeling good about what you're doing. The other guy starts looking at you. you. You know that. No matter what you compete in, that's what Paul is saying here. Don't be intimidated by a world that doesn't bow to and worship Christ. You do. When they look at you, they're going to say, wow, there's something about him. He might be right. And that'll help draw them in. Paul's speaking to people who are being persecuted by Roman soldiers. Most of us in this room aren't persecuted to that level, but we are, right? And sometimes we want, maybe are going to be shy rather than speaking up for who, we have a chance to be light in a very short period of time. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together 
you have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that you know I'm still in the midst of it. So what Paul's reminding them of is, hey, we have the privilege of trusting in Christ, of having that perspective while on this planet. Well, with that comes the privilege of suffering for him, suffering with him also. Everything's not going to always go perfect, but that's a privilege. It's, it shows it shows our relationship. Therefore, now we're in chapter two. Therefore, because of that, because of our citizenship is in heaven, because even though we're persecuted, we're not going to be intimidated, and we realize that we have, this is a privilege for us. Therefore, and if you look at this now, you look at this word "if." The cool thing about Greek is if. Words explain more. That if it can, is kind of like since. So he's not questioning whether they're, he knows. These are his buddies. He knows that they're encouraged in Christ. He knows that they have comfort in his love. So read it like this. Therefore, since you have encouragement in Christ, and since you, you're comforted with his love, and since you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and you have affection and compassion, so then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and purpose. That's how he wants us to live. So he goes on, go ahead and uh, go to verse, let's go to verse three and four, or page two on your bifold if, you, if you're looking at it that way. So <clears throat> he says, now, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Down to verse four. Each of you should not look at, should not look, should look not only at your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So in the early 1500s, there was a guy named Nicholas Copernic Copernicus. Okay, he was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, he was a Catholic canon. Well, he came up with a model of the universe that blew everybody's mind. Because everybody believed that we were the center of everything. Right? The earth was flat. Everything moved around us. And he came up with a model that said, no, <clears throat> actually the sun is the center of our solar system. The earth is round and we rotate around the sun. And people are like, what? No, <laughs> no way. No, we're the center. We're the center. We have a new puppy, Zeke. We picked it up four weeks ago. Zeke doesn't understand the component Copernicus's theory, right? He thinks everything, everything centers around him, right? He's a, he's a young puppy that thinks that if he runs in the street, cars should stop. <laughs> Whenever he wants something, we should answer to him. I mean, he's still at, he's only four, and we only have him four weeks. So, so he's still at this very young, but are we there? I mean, are you there? Do you sometimes think that everything should center around you? That everything is around you? Copernicus started a revolution, right? And, and this is what, but it's, it's what we're taught in the Bible. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride. <clears throat> we're told two things not to do. The bottom line is if we do these two things, we're more like Satan than, than ever. This was Satan's downfall. Selfish ambition, empty pride. If you haven't ever studied it, look at Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 14, Satan declares his five I wills. I will rise above the stars. I will ascend to the mountain. I will sit in the assembly. I will rise above the clouds. I will become like the most high. That's what Satan wanted to do. He, 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 we're told he was in charge of all the commerce. He was in charge of everything. And finally, he, like, pride crept, crept in. Look at what I'm doing. I'm not getting the credit God is. And he wanted to be like God. Paul goes in here. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to grab some water. Paul goes in Philippians, and we're going to save this for Christmas. <clears throat> this section of Philippians 2, when you get the five going on. He does such a beautiful explanation of what Christ did when he came. He didn't aspire to be like God. He reduced himself. He brought, he brought himself down. This is important to God, okay? We're told two things not to be. Don't, 
do nothing out of selfish ambition and empty pride, but in humility, consider others more important than yourselves. Do this one thing. Don't do two things. Don't do these two things. Take selfish ambition and pride off, but do this. Consider others more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility is a big thing. How important is humility to God in the Bible? I wrote down several references. Check this out. Job 22. God saves the humble. Psalm 14. God listens to the humble. Psalm 138. God attends to the humble. Isaiah 54, God dwells with the humble. Proverbs 29, God honors the humble. James 4, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It's a big thing. Do you know, 89 uh, chapters in the Bible are written about Jesus' life. Four of those chapters are his first 30 years. 85 of those chapters are the last three and a half years. Of those 85 chapters, 29 are the last week of his life. And of those 29, 13 are the last day of his life. And if you look at what's written, what did Jesus do? He kept taking himself and he kept taking himself and he said, I'm a servant. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to serve. I'm here to follow the Father's will. Every time there was a chance that he might he would step up, can you think of what he did? When you look at what, what's written in these chapters, <laughs> Peter tries to take a guy's ear off. He said, hey, I could have called legions if I wanted to do this. I could put these guys down. No. I'm here to do the Father's will. And the Father's will is that I come and I put myself out as a sacrifice. Jesus kept putting himself down and putting himself down and they're slapping him in the face and they're spitting on him. And think of what he could have done. He's a son of God. He could have done, you know, he kept humbling himself and humbling himself. And that's what Paul's underscoring. That's how God wants us to, to live. Put others before ourselves. Know what God wants us to do and live that way. And then what happens? Well, look at um, Philippians 2, verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. So for three and a half years, Jesus kept putting himself down and putting himself down and putting himself down. In this little red, God's asking us to be servants, to be bond servants, to serve others, to love others. And what will happen? Same thing he did for Jesus. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names. That the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's the name above all names? It says Christ is Lord. He's lovely. God presented him as Lord, our Adonai. And he even makes it personal. Adonai is my it's my lord my savior that's what god presents to us his son who can be our lord but we're also told that if we live like this he's going to exalt us here's the problem we have guys a lot of times we'll strive for confirmation from a man confirmation from a person and the problem with that is it's never enough because whoever that person is may confirm you, may acknowledge you once. And then when he doesn't do it the next time, you're like, hey, how come he didn't notice me this time? <laughs> how, come he, how come I wasn't called out this time? God doesn't want us chasing confirmation from man. He, will ex he wants to be humble, to serve, to be, be humble, and he will exalt us. Uh, October 2022 is a month I will never forget. In 11 days, I lost the two most influential men in my life. My, my father passed on the 19th, and then on Sunday, Gail Jackson, my mentor, went, went home to be with the Lord. And, and uh, what I can say about these guys, they, they both were looking forward to heaven. 
They both knew their time in the red was done. It's been interesting for me as I sit, you know, I've been sitting up at night, sitting on my bench, reflecting. What can I pull? What can I learn? I mean, can't pick up the phone and talk to them anymore, right? They were just just right here. And now, but now they're now they're in the white. Right? Now they're experiencing in the white. And here's what I know they've already experienced. Because we're told this is gonna happen. Right? We're told that that those who endure to the end, they're going to have a time with God and Jesus. And Jesus is going to tell God the Father, hey, this is the kind of things Gail did while he was on earth. Gail did this. And they're going to laugh together and be like, no, what? They're going to relive it. And they're going to celebrate. And the glory is going to be given to God in, in all of that. But that's the type of thing that's going on. I mean, God's exalting them up for what he did, for all the men he invested in, for, for, for everything he did, right? And we're told he's, my dad was given a white stone. She meant paid in full. You're, 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 everything's paid in full. And on that stone is his new name. Jesus was given the name Lord over everything. My dad was given a name that only he knows but it's his nickname with God. And we're all going to be given a name. God's going to exalt us. So yeah, this little time here in the red and what we go through, boy, it's important that we do this and remind each other that what he says matters. Listen up. What he, don't be intimidated by the world. Don't get distracted by this. This is all going to be gone like that, right? We're going to be there. And what we do here. Ken Bo and I used to sit, Gail Jackson and I used to sit and talk about characters in the Bible. And, and then we talk about what's going to be like to meet them. And, and you know, what Boa said to me, we don't all don't go in the same. <laughs> this time that we spend here, we're going into heaven with a different level of understanding where some other people are going to go in. We don't, we all go in forgiven. We're all there, right? But you come in with a different level of understanding, different things that you know, different relationship with the Father. Some people are going to be, we're going to continue to grow there. I want to go in knowing people, knowing him. When I see Jesus, there's not any second of, I just want to run to him, right? When I'm before God the Father, thank him for everything that he's done and not have a separation. That's how he wants us to enter in. It's what he did. All right. So two more sections, we'll head to the tables. Um, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my friends, just as you have always obeyed me when I was with you, it's even more important now in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who, who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good purpose. It's an interesting concept. And work out your salvation. <laughs> if, what does that mean exactly, right? So the word is ergazomai in the Greek. And here's the picture that Paul's painting. Now, yesterday, our granddaughter's in town. She flew in from Seattle, my daughter, my granddaughter. So we went up to Dahlonega to the Consolidated Gold Mine. You ever been there? You go 200 feet underground. And this, this mine up here, this gold mine, was mined during the 1800s. It's intriguing. I mean, it, they, they, all, they give you the experience. They shut off all the lights so they can see that, how dark it was, and you worked with a candle. And it's a really intriguing little tour, right? <laughs> but what Paul is saying in this word when he says, work out your salvation, it's like if you own that gold mine, okay, you own the gold mine. We own salvation through Christ. But to get the gold out of it, you got to work it, <laughs> right? When they went through what these guys did for these, this, that 50 years that that mine was there, it's incredible what they had to do. And what they did to get the to get the gold out. That's the same thing Paul's saying. Work, work, you have salvation. Work it out. I mean, experience it. Dig into the word. Pray. Have a relationship. Love each other. Have fellowship. Work out your salvation. It's like same same thing with a farmer. You own the field. The land's fertile. You're not gonna have any crops unless you work it out, right? You know, we can make it more simple. Here's a little harmonica. This thing is capable of doing incredible things, right? Mm -hmm. 
If I had time, I would do some jazz. No, I wouldn't. Don't know how. But, <laughs> but you can take something like this. If I took time to learn, I got this because my granddaughter wants it, right? She wants to learn how to play the harmonica. If she works it out, she's going to be able to do some amazing things with this. Same thing is true. What Paul's telling us, our salvation, we need to work it out. What does that mean? We get in the word. We pray. We fellowship. We worship. We activate. That's our part. Salvation is free. Now we work it out. Here's the amazing thing. Look at how he ends that verse. For it's God who works in you to will and to act on his good purpose. Anybody ever feel like just a feeling came over you? Man, I want to go deeper with God. All right, anybody ever, just raise your hand if you ever felt that. Keep it up. And anybody ever feel like, I, I want to pray more. I want, I want to go more in God's word. You know what that is? That's God working in you, that desire. That's what we're told. God, it's God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good purpose. The God of the universe knows you personally and is planting in you a will to get closer to him. Planting in you a desire to help other people. Planting in you a desire to say, I want to make a, and I want to pray for that person. Satan's going to kind of try to come around and grab that seed as quick as it drops and have you get busy with something. And that's the dance that we're in, right? And so what Paul's encouraging in this, saying, hey, work out your salvation and realize God's working in you while you're doing that. And so that umption that you feel, that's from him. That's from God. That's what he's doing for us. All right, last thing, and we'll go to the tables. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked, crooked, crooked and perverse generation in which you shine as lights in the world as you hold forth the word of light. So <laughs> there's that word, everything. He uses it in every chapter. In this chapter, chapter two, he says, hey guys, do everything without complaining. Why? What's it like to be around a complainer? It's like a barking dog that doesn't stop, right? It doesn't present. It takes his name in vain is what it does. You're not, you're not realizing who he is and what he's doing. You're complaining. Not, he doesn't want us to live that way. So he presents three really th dynamic things in this one little verse. Where are we? Who are we? And how are we supposed to live? Where are we? Who are we? How are we supposed to live? Where are we? We're in a crooked and perverse generation. That's where we're at. That word crooked is scoliosis. It is from where we get the word scoliosis. What's scoliosis? A crooked spine, right? It's crooked. It's, it's deviated from how it's divinely intended to be. It's off. Paul said, we live in a crooked generation, a crooked world. It's not how it's supposed to be. It's the red. It's not the white. For a short period of time, we're, in a, we're, we're living in a crooked generation. It's not how it's supposed to be. That's where we live. How are we supposed to live? We're light. We're called to be light. What we know we're supposed to be, we walk into darkness and bring light. Don't cover it. Jesus talks about that. Don't hide it. Let your light shine. Darkness needs it. People on, that we rub up against need it. And they will be drawn to it. And the Holy Spirit is always working. So take that will that God has put in you to say, I want to make a difference. And be that light. Be bold. Take your personality, take your context, take who you are and allow God to work through you boldly during this little bit of time that we're here on this planet. He closes the verse with, shine as lights in the world as you hold forth the word of life. One thing we know is God's word will never return void. So as we get to know God's word, 
and we use God's word and we speak about God's word and we share God's word, that's a powerful, powerful tool, tool that does not return void. Guys, what we do here on Friday mornings is important. We gather around the word. We encourage each other in the word. We discuss the word. We plant some seeds and hopefully you go home and you spend time on your bench. I want to go deeper into this. This is a 20 minute look into Philippians 2. Philippians 2 is a rich, rich chapter. All of this is. I can tell you that this for a fact, my dad, Gail Jackson, they have no regrets for the amount of time they spent here <laughs> in this word while they were here. It's one of my takeaways. I just resharpening myself, realizing they're there. I'm going to be there before I know it. <laughs> I'm going to plant myself more and more in what's really important in all that white that we have to look forward to. Live here fully, enjoy here fully, but take it to a whole nother level by being fully rooted, by staying away from empty, empty uh, selfishness and pride, being humble, and applying myself more and more to the word and the things he wants us to do. All right. Let's go to tables and we'll close in a little bit. Okay, we'll pull together. So let me pull from the floor just for a second. Um, any takeaway from this morning? Anything you talked about at the table? Anything that you might want to share with the room that said, you know what, this was uh, looking at Philippians 2, this was a reminder for me. We um, talked at the table. Samuel had uh, 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 something that was through the suffering and all the other guys also. Only through the suffering with Christ that you could really feel the joy and the peace and humility and love of Christ. So as we go through living in him, that suffering is really humbles us and really makes us mature Christians. That's the maturity we, we look for. And that's what Christ looks in us to do. Suffer with him, become one with him, feel the real peace and joy of walking with him. Uh, we just talked a little bit about the the idea of working out your salvation and how the mind and the feel was a great analogy and I, and all of us that kind of resonated with all of us um and just how much responsibility we have to go and work that that field of that mind thank you yeah it's you know this is a big topic it's a lot in chapter two and i encourage you guys to spend some time on your bench uh, let me point you to that Philippians 2, verse 4. Uh, each of you should not only look at your own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among your, yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We did not cover that part. What was, what was Jesus' mind, right? He was God, but he didn't, he didn't put his, himself in a position on earth to become God. He did the exact opposite that Adam did. Adam wanted, they wanted to take the apple because Satan said, hey, you take that bite, you can, you can be like God, right? You can have knowledge of everything. Jesus took, him, took it to a lower position, thinking about others. Uh, you know, think of a prideful person, think of a humble person. Who are you more attracted to? Who do you want to be more like? We talked at our table. Sometimes the thing we do is exactly, we do the same thing whether we're pride or whether we have humility. We're just doing it with a whole different mindset and for a whole other purpose, for that person, for his glory, instead of for what I can get out of it. Um, when Gail first challenged me on this whole thing, it frightened me a little bit. I was like, you know, 
I kind of like my edge. My wife would tell you today if she was here, she didn't like the version of Ron 17 years ago. <laughs> there was too much pride in there, right? And so, and you know, where does that melt down? It melt down with him on the bench, giving it over. Just the same thing that Jesus, why did Jesus get up every single morning, find a place to pray, find a place to be with the Father? So he could keep putting it down and say, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? We're drawn to Jesus because of who he was, and that's what he was, a servant. So let me close with this. Um, Epaphroditus, you know who that is? I probably had him in the category with hepatitis and appendicitis. <laughs> but Paul points this guy out. You know, in our lives, we there's certain guys. You know, in my life, it was, you know, Walt Hendrickson, it was Crawford Loritz, it was Gail Jackson, um, you know, we've got Chuck Ramsey, we have Leo Giglio in town, and there's there's a few guys like that that are like mountains of men, right? Most of us are like Epaphroditus. If we were in the Bible, maybe we could show up as an Epaphroditus, right? Let's re let me just read what Paul says about this guy in, in uh, chapter 2. I thought it good that I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He's my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and a minister to my needs. I'm, I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one, one, one more sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the, in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. <laughs> honor men like him. We have men like him in this room, right? Most of you guys are men like that. And I think a, a, a good reminder in this lesson on, not, on, on humility is also to honor the guys who serve us. Honor the table leaders who are serving you. Honor the, the guys who show up to set up the table. Honor the guys who work tirelessly so that we can have a ministry like this. And you know what else they're doing in their lives because you're having a table around them. We need to be encouraged, and encouraged to be men like this in this crooked and perverse generation because it is crooked out there and it is dark out there, but we can be light. But you know what? We also need, it also helps that we, when we're encouraged and we're honored in living and being that way. So be that guy that does that as well. Certainly pray while you're on your bench, but every now and then walk up to a guy and say, I want to thank you for who you are. You know who was the biggest encourager in my life? Gail Jackson. That gritty old guy, <laughs> he would call me all the time and he would just say, Ron, keep doing what you're doing. Keep What you're doing is making a difference. It was, he was such a big encourager. And then he, this is the thing I was laughing about. He, he would say, hey, you need to start doing less. You're doing too much. And then by the end of the conversation, he goes, Here's some, you should write another book. You should write some blogs. I said, Gail, you just said I should do less. You give me more to do. <laughs> He's always fine tuning, right? So anyway, hey, think about who it is in your life that's like an Epaphroditus to you. That's a guy that God put in your life that's kind of helping you, helping you along the way. Thank that guy. Honor that guy. These guys are important, and let's all be guys like that. All right, go ahead and close at your table. Next week, we're going to be back with the uh, part three and the final on abiding with Christ. And then, like Ryan said, we'll be off for two weeks. Consider giving the shoebox. It's a great, there's not many ministries like that. They have a network where they take the shoebox of a gift for a kid who wouldn't have a gift if he wasn't given that shoebox at Christmas. But with the gift comes the message of the ultimate gift. Somebody is verbally telling them the story why we're doing this. So it's a great ministry to get behind. I don't see that. You can go online, Samaritan's Purse. You can pick an age group. You can pick a boy or a girl. As a table, maybe consider doing a box or two. Drop them off here that morning. And I encourage you guys not to take off for two weeks. It's great sometimes just to get together. Get your table together and have breakfast. And at that breakfast, let each guy say, hey, here's what's going on in my life right now. Here's how God's working. And here's how I hope God works. And just have a time of encouragement. Be an Epaphroditus with each other. All right. Love you guys. Close your table and see you back next week.